Well, good morning, and it's great to see you. I feel like I have been gone much uh, too often this fall with travel that has taken us to China, San Diego, Minneapolis, Chicago, Washington, D.C., New York City, Charlotte, Jacksonville, and I think I've missed a few in between. And then unexpectedly, a trip to Indiana last week with regards to the death of Mary Ann's mother. Uh, especially hard when it's the last of our parents to go. She was 95 years old, but it was a wonderful family time and a reminder to us of the great godly heritage that we have and what a great role model, and I'm deeply, deeply thankful for that. But it's good to be back with you, always good to be back home, and good to be here at the seminary campus. Conflict seems to be an inevitable part of life. Some of you who are single live in the dormitories, and you may have a roommate, and my guess is that somewhere along the line this semester, you've had some conflict. Some of you are married. My guess is this week you've had some (laughs) issue of conflict. Some of you have children, and you've run into conflicts with your kids. We have conflicts, it seems, in every sphere of life. We have it in our churches. We have it in our communities. We have it in our society. It's everywhere. We've witnessed intense racial conflict in in recent months in the aftermath of the Michael Brown killing and the decision uh, in the aftermath of that a history of injustices, a history of suspicion has left a community deeply, deeply divided. We often expect that when it comes to the church and when you get inside the walls of the church, there will not be conflict. But the reality is conflict is in the church and whatever phase of ministry you go into, you can expect conflict. Just a few weeks ago, I was having a conversation with a friend regarding a mutual acquaintance, someone he knew better than I did. And it was a gentleman regarding a gentleman who had pastored three churches in his life over the years, very gifted preacher, deep student of the word of God. In fact, when he preached, he preached from the Greek or the Hebrew text. But each of his pastorates ended in very significant conflict. He left all three churches with a sense of bitterness and hurt. Congregations were deeply divided. Some of his own making, some of the congregations making, no doubt. This gentleman is now retired. He looks back on what he hoped would be a promising ministry and conflict had overwhelmed his entire pastoral life. You can expect conflict in ministry and every sphere of life. In a fallen world, it's inevitable that we will sometimes have differing opinions about how to proceed and how to get things done. Those conflicts sometimes will cut deep, causing disruption and great disunity. The key issue is not whether you will be able to avoid conflicts. You won't. The key issue is what do you do with the conflicts when they emerge? Will the conflicts tear us apart and our relationships apart? Will we perpetuate the conflicts by sweeping them under the rug? Or will we be able to find resolution to the conflicts that brings healing and reconciliation in the context of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Our passage today is one that I think can help us to think about how we deal with conflicts when they emerge in the various spheres of life. It's Philippians chapter 2, and I invite you to turn to that passage with me this morning. We have just begun Advent, which is, of course, the period when we look back to Christ's first coming in the Incarnation, and we look forward to his second coming. Our passage today focuses on the first coming, on the Incarnation. 
It focuses on the incarnation not just as a theological understanding or as a doctrine, but also as a model for our lives and especially in relationship to this whole issue of conflict. I know there are many people who see theology and Christian doctrine as abstract and irrelevant to everyday life. But here in Philippians chapter 2, and this is true of many theological teachings in Scripture, theology has significant implications for our practice. It has significant implications for how we live in the various spheres of life, and this one, I think, is particularly relevant to the issue of conflict. The Philippian church seemed to be a rather healthy church. I think it's one you would have liked to have pastored. He begins the epistle by giving thanks to God every time he remembers them. Joy is a major theme throughout this epistle to the church of Philippi. There are not a lot of strong indictments in this epistle in the same way you have in the Corinthians correspondence in which Paul is constantly bringing up major, major issues in that city. But there was one negative on the church at Philippi. It was conflict and the subsequent disharmony that flowed out of that conflict. In chapter 4, he's very explicit about it. He says, I plead with Eodia and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord, and yes, I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel. Paul doesn't tell us what the issue was, what the conflict was all about, But clearly there was an issue here between these two people who had actually been ministers of the gospel with Paul, had served with him in the advancement of the gospel, but something was tearing them apart. In chapter 1, he alludes to what seemed to be a, a conflict over motivation in preaching the gospel. Verse 15, he says, some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry. Verse 17, some were preaching Christ out of selfish ambition. And so in this church, you had people proclaiming the gospel, but there were conflicted reasons why they were proclaiming the gospel. Paul still gives thanks that the gospel was being proclaimed, even if it's out of false motives. And then here in chapter 2, it's generally agreed that behind Paul's admonition and encouragement lurks conflict that were dividing, was dividing the people, tearing at the fabric of faithful unity. Paul begins this chapter by, by reminding them of the great resources that they have in the faith to experience unity and overcome the divide caused by the conflict. Verses 1 and 2. Therefore, if we have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. The if of these phrases in verse verse 1 assumes that they are real the implication is since, since we are united with Christ, since there is comfort from his love, since there is a common sharing in the Holy Spirit, since there are virtues of tenderness and compassion that flow from being united with Christ, since these things are real, He says, then make my joy complete. He already has joy for them, but make it full, if you will by being like-minded and having the same love, being of one spirit and one mind. It is, of course, one thing to expect conflict and disharmony in the natural fallen world. But I think what Paul is saying here is that in the church, where there are supernatural realities and supernatural perspectives, we should expect something different. We should expect love. We should expect being of one mind, even in those situations where we may not always agree as to how you get things done. There is a way of still finding a commonality and a commitment to the things that are really vital and the purposes that God has for us. 
Think about this in terms of a marriage. For those of you who are married, or someday will be married, you will at times have differences over a host of issues. How to spend money, how to spend time, what you're going to do this weekend, besides studying for exams for next week, how to deal with various situations, how to discipline the children, how to spend your vacation, and on the list it can go. There'll be great differences. But it is possible in the midst of those differences to still, to still be of one mind, one spirit, an overall commitment and purpose that you have together, even with the differences. And it is that overall commitment that will enable you to work your way through the differences that you often have. Since the supernatural realities are present to bring reconcil reconciliation and healing in the conflicts, Paul goes on here to give the ethical appeal in verses 3 through 4. He writes, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of of others. Paul here, I think, is very clear that the real source of our conflicts and the disunity that then tears us apart out of our conflicts isn't just differing opinions. The issues are what? Selfish ambition, vain conceit, people looking after their own interest. It is really the sin of self-centeredness that is the culprit. Ben Watson is a professional football player. He's a tight end for the New Orleans Saints. After the decision was handed down by uh, the grand jury in Ferguson the other week, Ben Ferguson sat down and wrote his reflections, his thoughts. It's some of the most insightful and balanced perspectives I've seen. Ben was initially drafted by the New England, New England Patriots, and he played here for a number of years. While he played for the Patriots, he took several courses at Gordon-Conwell at our Boston campus. He's African-American, father of four, and I commend his essay to you. It's gone viral, spread all over the country, more than 600,000 hits the last I saw. Even been picked up by NBC, NBC News online. And I want to quote a bit of what he says because I think it fits so much with what Paul is saying. He wrote this after he heard the news of the grand jury just as he was about to play on Monday night football. He said, I'm angry because the stories of injustice that have been passed down for generations seem to be continuing before our very eyes. I'm frustrated. Because pop culture, music, and movies glorify these types of police citizen altercations and promote an invincible attitude that continues to get young men killed. I'm fearful. Because in the back of my mind, I know that although I'm a law abiding citizen, I could still be looked upon as a threat to those who don't know me. I'm embarrassed. Because the looting, violent protests, and lawbreaking only confirm and in the minds of many validate the stereotypes and thus the inferior treatment. I'm sad because another young life was lost from his family. The racial divide has widened. A community is in shambles. I'm sympathetic because I wasn't there, so I don't even know exactly what happened. I'm offended because of the insulting comments I've seen that are not only insensitive, but dismissive to the painful experience of others. I'm confused because I don't know why it's so hard to obey a policeman. You will not win. And I don't know why some policemen abuse their power. I'm introspective because sometimes I want to take our side without looking at the facts in situations like these. Sometimes I feel like it's us against them, and sometimes I'm just as prejudiced as people I point fingers at. I'm hopeless because I've lived long enough to expect things like this to continue to happen. But he goes on, and in the end he says, but I'm encouraged. Because ultimately, the problem is not a skin problem 
It's a sin problem. Sin is the reason we rebel against authority. Sin is the reason we abuse our authority. Sin is the reason we are racist, prejudiced, and lie to cover for our own. Sin is the reason we riot, loot, and burn. But I'm encouraged because God has provided a solution for sin through his son Jesus, and with it, a transformed heart and mind. One that's capable of looking past the outward and seeing what is truly important in every human being. The cure for the Michael Brown, Trayvon Martin, Tamir Rice, and Eric Garner tragedies is not just education or exposure, it is the gospel. And so finally, I'm encouraged because the gospel gives mankind hope. You see, I think that fits so well with what Paul is saying here in the second chapter of Philippians. It is sin that is the root cause of all of our conflicts from our marriages to our churches to our nation as a whole and to our communities. And rather than the self-centeredness, rather than the self-orientation which orients us as with certain perspectives and outlooks on life and is at the root of our conflicts, rather than that self-centeredness, Paul calls us to humility and seeking the interests of others. Think how different the world would be if humility and seeking the interests of others really reigned in human hearts. I think all of us really are drawn to people who are humble, especially gifted people who are humble and have a proper understanding of themselves, not negating their gifts, understanding them as good gifts of God, but not picking up on those gifts and so orienting their life that they are everything, not seeking their own ambitions, but really seeking the ambitions of others with the gifts that God has given to them. Think how different our churches would be. Ambrose, the great church father who lived in the fourth century, became, before he became a bishop, he seemed to have it all. He was a successful lawyer in Milan, a governor of Milan, of that jurisdiction, of that area, owned a large estate. In the year 374, the bishop of Milan died. The bishop was an individual who had supported the Arian heresy, the heresy that said that Christ was not fully God or equal with God. Following the death of the bishop, the Arian group and the Orthodox group met at the cathedral and a riot broke out, violence in the midst of the city. Who would be the next bishop? What direction would the Church of Milan go? Being the governor, Ambrose hurried to the cathedral and he made a passionate plea, speech, for peace. While he was speaking, a child's voice was heard. Ambrose for bishop. Ambrose for bishop. And soon the crowd began to pick up the chant, Ambrose for bishop. And in the ensuing days, it was very clear that the people and other religious authorities thought Ambrose was the right person. He was horrified at the prospect. Who was he to lead a people spiritually, especially in such times of conflict? As a matter of fact, he felt so inadequate, he ran away and he hid. And it took the emperor to finally persuade him to accept the position. He finally gave in, he sold his lush property, he put himself under the instruction of a well-known saint in order to learn scripture and to learn theology. And Ambrose went on to be a great leader, humble leader. In resolving the conflicts, he did not back down on his theological convictions. He was dead set against the Arian heresy. But he persuaded the people on all sides that violence was not the way to settle a theological dispute. And with humility and conviction, he led the church in Milan for several decades. Truth and reconciliation marked his leadership. You see, that kind of humility and that kind of commitment together is what reflects the very life of Christ himself. 
And that's what Paul says in verse 5. In your relationship with one another, have the same mind as Christ Jesus. Paul goes on to give then a very powerful and beautiful account of the incarnation as a model to follow in the midst of our conflicts that are fueled by our own self-centeredness. Have this mindset as Christ Jesus had, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, but rather he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even the death on a cross. These verses and the next verses that go through verse 11 are thought to be an ancient hymn that was perhaps used liturgically in the early church. We often refer to it as the kenosis passage because of the Greek word that is used in verse 7. NIV has it, he made himself nothing. The literal translation is, he emptied himself, the kenosis word. There's not agreement on who wrote the hymn, but because of its stately language and the rhythmic cadence of the lines, the general agreement is that this is in poetic form and was likely a hymn that the early church used. And Paul here uses this great hymn of the incarnation to say, have the mind of Christ in you when you deal with the conflicts that emerge in life. What is the mind of Christ evident in the incarnation? Well, he tells us, though he was in nature God, Though he was fully one with the Father and the Spirit, he didn't consider that status of equality something to be grasped at for his own self-interest, which is itself the very source of disharmony. Instead, he made himself nothing. He emptied himself by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. He emptied himself of what? Obviously not his deity. He emptied himself of all the prerogatives he had in heaven with God the Father. He set aside all that he had in that great estate of being in heaven with God. Removed from the sinfulness of this world. Removed from temptation. Removed from judgment and prejudice removed from all of the things that weigh us down on this fallen earth. Jesus did not consider it something to cling to out of his own self-interest. He emptied himself of those prerogatives. He laid aside all that he had in heaven to become a human being in the midst of a broken and sinful world. And he emptied himself of all that, even to the point of death becoming obedient to death, even the death of a cross, the most violent, vile way a person could die in the Roman Empire. In order for Jesus to become the savior of the world, he could not cling, you see, to the safety and the security of heaven. 2 Corinthians 8, 9 puts it this way. Though he was rich, for your sakes he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. The mind of Christ, then, is the mind that we need to deal with the conflicts when they emerge in life. Rather than selfish ambition, vain conceit, self-interest, follow Christ, follow the pattern of the incarnation. Though he was fully God and enjoyed the privileges of heaven with the triune God, He set aside those incredible privileges, the glories to enter our world. He humbled himself, sought out our interest rather than his own interest, gave up himself rather than self-ambition and vain conceit. And the result? Therefore God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. 
the result of this incredible act of mercy and grace, of emptying himself of all the prerogatives he had, of becoming an actual servant in this world. The result is that he is exalted. Such exaltation that he's given the name that is above every name, perhaps referring to the name Lord. Jesus' exalted status, of course, did not change the essence of who he was. He didn't somehow become God-like, but rather he exalted in the sense that he completes the plan that God had for a broken, fallen human race, so that at the name of Jesus, one must bow in order to know God and experience his forgiveness and his hope. Embedded in all of this is the principle that Jesus himself taught in Matthew chapter 23, verse 12. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Jesus humbled himself in the incarnation and is therefore exalted And this becomes the pattern we are to follow in the face of conflict and threats to disharmony when they come and they tend to unglue us. There is a thing, I think, a a kind of human exaltation when we take on the mind of Christ rather than selfish ambition and vain conceit. There is an exaltation in which in humility we rise above the petty conflicts that bring havoc to relationships, disharmony to our communities, and ultimately dissatisfaction to our souls. Conflict is a reality. Will you have conflicts in your marriage? Indeed you will. The question is what will you do with them? How will you respond? Will you experience conflicts in ministry to which God is calling you? It's inevitable. I can assure you of it. Will we continue to have conflicts in our communities, in our society, ethnic, racial, national conflicts? Indeed, in this fallen world, we unfortunately will. In the midst of those conflicts that tend to undo our most precious, our most trusted relationships, for our part, from what we can do, Let us have the mind of Christ, who gave up all that he had in heaven that we might come to him, that we might experience his forgiveness, that we might be reconciled with the creator of the universe and in turn be reconciled to one another even in the midst of our conflicts. As Ben Watson said about Ferguson, in the midst of that unfortunate and great conflict there, I'm encouraged because the gospel gives mankind hope. And that gospel, you see, is made possible by the incarnation. And it is that incarnation which is the very pattern for you and for me as we deal with the conflicts that are part of our life. In your relationship, with one another, have the same mind as Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen.